Jesus, you never miss a moment, you are here and now, you are here and now, oh my Jesus, you never miss a moment. my 
my soul, soul. Jesus, 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 we open the door, we let you in, we hear you knocking, yeah, we open the door of our hearts this morning, Lord, take your rightful place, God. Just lift our hands, come on, all over the place. Begin to sing in the spirit, out loud, come on, fill this room. That's right. Lift your voice today. Sing in the spirit. your voice. I sense a breakthrough. Come on. 
That's it. Jesus, you inhabit the praises of your people. Come on in. Come on in. And yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, yours is the glory forever, amen. Yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, yours is the glory.
on in Lord fall like fire we didn't come to play a game this morning to host an event we want you Jesus fall like fire now on every heart fall like fire on every heart King Jesus you're beautiful and holy and wonderful perfect, kind and loving. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Tell him you love him, would you please? Just, we love you. We love you. We just love you. Jesus, we love you. Everything about you. Everything about you, everything is so wonderful. So just close your eyes, lift your hands to heaven, come on. Just love him, just begin to love him. Oh Lord, who is like you in heaven and on the earth, you're perfect in all your ways. Restore the wonder of Jesus in our hearts, Holy Spirit. Mesmerize us with his beauty. Oh, you're wonderful. Oh, you're wonderful. Oh, you're wonderful. You're the point. You're the goal. <laughs> you're the message. Oh, Jesus. beautiful husband you're longing for love and we're here to love you <laughs> I hear him asking to be loved today oh we're here to love you Jesus we remember when we wept reading the scriptures take us back God restore childlike wonder 
Every song made us cry. Every song went straight to you. Master, kill. Kill every idol. <laughs> Murder it with the sword of heaven. Raise up Levites who look at you and love you and move you. And move you. And know the way in. Know the way in. And when they're there, they're fulfilled with you. Holy Spirit, burn the face of Jesus on our hearts. Oh, we love you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing. Take a deep breath in his presence. He's restoring the amazement. Oh, Lord Jesus. I said, Jesus. You got to come in today. He said, I will. And then I said, well, when you do, I'm, I'm not moving on. I, <laughs> you're, you're, you're the point. If you're not here, then this is not even a Christian event. You're the point. You, you're the point. We recognize you here, Lord. And we want you to know that We'll love you. You know, it's possible to cry out for revival and never tell Jesus you love him. <laughs> but here we love you, Lord. Come on in and skip, skip upon the hills. King of glory. King of glory. Wow, we love you. Why don't you find your way back to your seats if you came forward, but go in the presence of the Lord. Just keep it right here, guys, in your hearts. Go ahead. Wow, Dave, you want to come over here? Jesus here this morning. How many of you feel Jesus here this morning? Can we lift a shout of praise? Don't tip him. Don't tip him with a shout. Can we lift a shout that moves heaven? Come on, lift a shout. What a morning. What a morning. Thank you so much, Amanda, Steph, and Jeremy. Wasn't that beautiful? And the whole crew. Thank you. That's so good. Um, I, we did run a little past schedule, but how many of you know that Jesus is worth it? I think some of you are willing to go to lunch late for an encounter, wouldn't you say? Many of you have paid an amazing price to get here. My job is to make sure that you have an opportunity to see the burning bush. And it just got lit on fire this morning. The bush is burning and I hear the voice of the Lord. He's here. Oh, my dear friend Dave Popovici is here with us. Can we welcome Dave? An amazing man of God. And uh, man, he's been with us since the beginning. He and his wife, Danielle. Danielle, would you stand please? Let Danielle know you love her. Um, in 2015, it was the first 
I remember the first moment the glory of God came into one of our events. And that was in 2015. And Dave had just ministered. And basically ministered a message to come and die. To give your life to Jesus. Just to give it all. And I remember Dan and I were standing in the back. And Dan said, bro, I feel like something's about to hit the room. Give it about five seconds. And sure enough, how many of you remember that moment when David Brimer led? And it was just amazing. But Dave really carries, he's like a living portal for the glory of God. And so I want us to position our hearts in honor and hunger this morning. And I want you to welcome with everything in you, my dear friend and brother, David Papavici. Would you do that, please? Thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Lord, we worship you this morning. And Lord, just as Michael said, Lord, we turn our attention to you, Lord. We want that burning bush, the reality of who you are and the living voice to grip our hearts. Lord, speak life into us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I have to say, I have to say first, for those of you guys that were not here last night, you missed something very powerful. Brother Dan shared a message on what the true gospel is, a call to come to Jesus and to lay down your life. I about got born again and, and was ready to sell all and go again. <laughs> And it's so important because the, the depth of our revelation of the Lord determines how deep we can go into repentance. And the depth of our repentance produces the depth of our faith, the, the, what our Christian life consists of. And I really feel gripped by the Lord. I really feel like the Lord is wanting to speak that same thing to us today. You know, the last two set of instructions that Jesus gave his disciples were to wait and to go. And waiting, being together and beholding his face just like we did this morning. Just like I did this morning when I woke up and I opened the scriptures and beheld his voice. Waiting is not a one-time event. Waiting before the Lord is a way of life. And the other set of instructions is to go. Going is not a suggestion. It's not the great suggestion, right? It's the great commission. Going is not for those who would consider themselves fivefold ministers. Going is the call of every believer. And it's always been God's intention for his people ever since the old covenant when God called Abraham. And out of Abraham he created a nation. He told Abraham, come and go. Come to me. That's wait upon me. Come to me and go. I will bless you, but not just so that you would be blessed. I will make you a blessing. And we live in a culture today that's so focused on ourselves. Self-importance, self-worth. Self is at the center of so much. Even often what we hear within Christian circles, it's all about exalting self. And that's one of the reasons that as believers, often we struggle with joy. Because joy is Jesus. The less that we're taken up with ourselves, the more that we're taken up with his face, the more that we're taken up with his cause, the cause of the gospel and the earth, the more that we can touch genuine and deep everlasting joy. Amen. We live in such a confused culture. The truth of the matter is that without the love of God, we, we, we have no life. But identity comes from the revelation of who Jesus is. There's so much confusion in living in an over-sexualized culture. Confusion. Men think that they're women. Women think that they're men. There's brokenness. You can't even say anything. 
Affirmation has a deep place in the scriptures, in the economy of the kingdom of God. But uh, you can't even say anything. Because everything is so oversensitized. But Jesus and his words have never changed. He's always calling people to himself to lay down their lives and inviting them to join him in his mission in the earth. If you can, please turn to Romans 15. And as you do, you know, we, we remember Israel. Israel's call was to, is to be distinct from the nations. Israel was called to the Lord. They were the one nation in the earth in the old covenant that had Yahweh as their God. And they were called to the Lord to behold his face. And th their entire way of life was oriented around this place called the tabernacle. The presence of God was central to all. And the second part of that call was that they were to be a light to the nations. And in both of those areas, in different ways, they failed. And then Jesus comes to his own people, the majority of which reject them. He has a core group of disciples. They wait upon him in that upper room. They behold glory. He baptizes them with the Holy Spirit and fire. How many of you believe the Lord wants to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire during these next several days in Jesus' name? He baptizes them with the Holy Spirit and fire. He gives them a flaming tongue, which represents divine communion with God and divine communication from that place to the nations. He could have come in any form. It could have been a burning hand, but it was a burning tongue. It could have been a burning eye, it was a burning tongue. Because the Lord desires to communicate to us in a divine way and communicate through us in a glorious and powerful way. But you know what's interesting is that even though the Lord in those final couple of weeks with his disciples up on that mountain, he spoke to them and he says, all authority has been given to me. And I say to you, go. Make disciples of the nations. And, and then here was the reward. Here was the reward attached with the calling. And I will be with you. Remember what he told Abraham? I will be your exceedingly great reward. That, that's the payoff of laying down our lives and investing it in the cause of the gospel in the nations. Is that he comes with us. But you know what's interesting? Is that as powerful as, as, as the glory of God was in that early church, it, was still, it still needed to be developed. That early church was a pure church, but it was not the fully mature and complete bride that Jesus will return for in this last generation. We have to believe if we believe the scriptures. That the last generation church will be the most glorious church that has ever walked the earth. Jesus is going to return for a fully developed bride. Complete and adorned with glory and adorned with his beauty. Pure and spotless without any blemish. And that early church was pure but it was undeveloped. And one of the ways that we see that is, although they experience the glory of God in powerful ways, how many of us can say that we walked with Jesus and we beheld him and touched his flesh, had a meal with the Lord, sat in his meetings face to face. Those early apostles could. However, it took almost 15 years to bring the gospel outside of Israel. 15 years. Till Paul showed up. It's an interesting thing. I think sometimes when we read the scriptures, we so deify these, these men and women of God who were broken before the Lord, recognizing how desperately they needed his presence. Apart from his word, apart from his leading, apart from the maturity of the Holy Ghost, they, they, had, they recognized they were bankrupt, they had nothing. Sometimes we think of these men, most of which when they were called to follow Jesus, were probably in their late teenage years. 
We think of them as if they had no problems, they had no issues, they had no struggles. But it took almost 15 years to leave Israel. Persecution shot up in Israel as, as a result of, of the faith. Stephen died, then James died. Some of the believers scattered, went to different places. But it wasn't until Acts 13, when there's a, there was a group of believers in Antioch that were ministering to the Lord and beholding his face, that the Lord spoke in a very distinct way and reminded that group of believers of what he had said almost 15 years prior. So Romans chapter 15 started in verse 16. Well, let's just start in verse 14. Paul says, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness and filled with all knowledge, able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given to me by God to be a minister, a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God. So that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Ghost. This is the way Paul understands his identity and his calling in the earth. He said, God has called me to be a minister in the priestly service. Those two words in the original language are synonymous to the talk of or the, or the, or the name or the title of what priests would do in their priestly function, the liturgical function in the tabernacle and the temple. In the old covenant we see priests, they behold the Lord, they minister to the Lord, they offer up sacrifices on the altar, they offer up incense on the altar. This is their function, this is what they do. This is how they're brought up. And Paul is saying nothing has changed in regards to why our identity we live before his face however now our ta our temple is a mobile one and the sacrifices that we offer are our very lives and the ones that we offer to the Lord are people groups and nations he says a minister of Christ to the Arabs. A minister of Christ to the people from the Sentinelese Islands. A minister of Christ to Far East Asia. A minister of Christ to South America. A minister of Christ, a priest of the Lord, who's defined by the presence of God, who's called to go offer a people for his namesake. The sacrifice is not what the Gentiles can give. The sacrifice is the Gentiles. That's the sacrifice. The sacrifice are the people themselves. This is what New Testament apostolic priestly service looks like. This is what Paul was consumed with. This is what Dan was talking about last night. This is the gospel. And there's two surefire ways for us to resist elements of God's presence and to short circuit any move of God. Two surefire ways. Ignore his presence as central and don't give yourselves to the gospel and preaching it to the lost as far as you possibly can and making disciples. Two guaranteed ways to short circuit anything from heaven. And here goes Paul, stating what his life looks like. And he goes on to say, in Christ Jesus then I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem all the way to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. That word ministry, once again, same word used for tabernacle. 
And thus I have made it my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ has not already been named, lest I should build upon another's foundation. But as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. Why? Because I'm so busy doing this. I've wanted to come to you to Rome, but I'm so taken up with this, ministry, this divine new covenant priesthood of beholding his face as a way of life and preaching the gospel and planting people and teaching them how to enter into his presence, to behold him, to become like him, to lay down their lives on the altar of God that he would be praised and magnified amongst the nations. I've been so caught up with that, I haven't had the chance yet to visit you in Rome. He says, but I will. I hope to see you, he says. I've longed for many years to come to you, verse 24. I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. Spain in the mind of a Jew during this time in the first century was about as far as the world went. You know, there was no internet, there was no, there weren't the maps, places haven't been, that hadn't been discovered like they are today. Spain was literally the edge of the known world. Paul's ambition was to bring this gospel, this presence-centered gospel to the ends of the earth, no matter what it would cost. And I think sometimes, you know, for, for us, we think to ourselves, we think to ourselves about the price that we have to pay in, in a very unusual way. When we see the price without seeing the price through the lens of his face, we become consumed with a lot of different things. And this is why Paul used this talk of priesthood. Because his call, his identity, his call, his purpose can only be understood from the context of God's presence and his voice. And because of that, he understood there was nothing, nothing that he would not do. You know what he tells the Philippians? He says, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, I'm hard pressed on both sides. For on the one side, I desire to go to be with him. That's what I really want. But for your sakes, it's better that I remain how many of you this morning, after you spent time with Jesus, got up, took a shower and said, if you want me to go right now, just I'll drop dead in this moment. I so want to be with you. There's nothing I want to be more than with you. I don't, how many of you think like that? I mean, this, this, this man was, he was possessed with a desire for the Lord. He so, he so wanted the Lord. Who talks like that? Turn quickly to Colossians chapter 1. I'll read one more verse. Colossians chapter 1 starting in verse 24. A passage that has puzzled Many through the years, I remember when I first got born again, I used to think to myself, what is he talking about? Colossians 1.24, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings. We can stop right there and think about how different our lives often are from his. He says, I rejoice in my sufferings. Not I rejoice just for suffering's sake, but in the midst of suffering, I find joy. You know what the beauty of suffering is? is it strips you of comfortable aspects and things in your life that you depend on a little bit too much. Suffering has a way of stripping you. Jesus tells his disciples when he sends them out two by two, take no money bag with you. It's always an interesting thing to me that he tells them to do that. Take no money bag with you. He wants them to learn the process of dependency to the utmost.
He says, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. Of which I became, again, a minister, here goes that word again, according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, once again, beholding his faces unto something. The mystery hidden for ages and generations but now revealed to the saints, to them whom God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of his mystery. What is this mystery that has been hidden for thousands of years that they at that point could not wrap their minds around? Christ in you, the hope of glory. The people are the sacrifice. God has always desired to possess a people. God doesn't possess buildings. God possesses people. He possesses people. People groups are possessed by God. No matter what their language may be, no matter what their culture may look like, God desires to possess people. He starts to, to install a different culture, a different way of living that mirrors the culture of heaven. Where worship is central, where laying down our lives is the way that we commune. Where reward is anchored in the coming age where we do not fear the potential of loss or death. When we don't fear death, we make a statement to powers and principalities and cultures and nations that what we have is superior. Often we're asked, you know, because we live in Iraq, we're asked often, and I understand people's, in, you know, their, their intentions are, are, they have good intentions in asking these questions, but they'll often ask questions like this. Is it safe there? I think more than any other thing I get asked, is it safe there? Second question, are the schools good there? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with those questions. I just wish they wouldn't be number one and number two. How about you bump them down to like number 89 and number 90? When we think about whether or not it's worth giving our lives for people groups where it may require our life. How good the schools are is not on God's top 10 priority list. The Lord is much more concerned about your children than you are. That's a promise. But we don't understand everything. We can't always understand the way heaven works from down here. When we come up high, when he says come up here and we come up high and we see things from his perspective, we start to understand things differently. What is it then that holds us back as people from really giving all? When, when Dan gave that altar call last night to lay it all down, when we're talking about this, this young man who gave his life for these people. It's so easy. To think about this young man who gave his life over there in the Sentinelese Islands and think to, think to ourselves, what fruit does he have to show? We have no record of anybody being born again. It's very likely nobody got born again before he died. What, it, was, it was a waste. He could have been more productive. Maybe he could have started a podcast and tried to use the podcast to try to drop you know through drones drop off satellite radios or something you know and maybe some songs in their native tongue which of course most people don't know but something maybe they might understand and they're slowly introducing the idea it's so easy to to measure success the way that we do as people based upon our own standards and say his life was a waste but God sees things completely differently what is it that holds us back so often? So often it's the compromise in our own lives that deafens us. It deafens our ears and our affections to the call to go. It's because we don't understand what Paul said in Romans 15. He saw himself as a priest. Twice he uses two different words that talk about the same thing. He says, this is my priestly service in the gospel. If we don't behold his face and we're not beholding his, his voice both in the place of worship and presence and in his word, it's very unlikely you will ever hear the call. The Lord can only speak to us to the degree that our hearts are aligned to what he has revealed 
to his people. Isn't it interesting that groups of believers around the world that, that, that completely pass over or perhaps black highlight, I'm saying that facetiously, passages in the scripture that have to do with, for example, healing. It's, why is it that groups, for example, that don't see healing as part of the atonement or part of redemption today, why is it for some reason that there's almost no healings ever? Do you think it's because the Lord doesn't want to heal them? Why is it that groups that are perhaps, they don't understand the, 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 the value of family and that God is a family of one. Why is it that in, in, in those types of settings, typically family struggles, marriages struggle. Do you think it's coincidental that the Lord is never speaking something to them about family? Why is it that if we don't understand that the call to go and give our lives for nations is central to the gospel, for some reason nobody ever happens to get called? And if they do get called, it's definitely not going to be somewhere where in the top 10 questions, is it safe there and how good are the schools, don't come out with positive answers. Right? We must live before his face and bury our hearts in the scriptures. Listen, brainwash yourself with the truth. Because the truth will drive out wrong ways of thinking that resists the Lord. I think often even, even here in the United States of America, the church in the United States has done so much. As, as, as far as I heard the last statistics, the, the, the American church is still sending out by actual number the most missionaries to anywhere in the world. May it continue, may it continue, may it grow, may it be multiplied. Especially in today's generation where so much of what we give ourselves for is, is our, it's the selfie culture. That's what it is. It's a selfie culture. The love of money and comfort will cripple your obedience to Jesus. There it is. You talk about money in a Western setting, you start touching nerves. The love of money and comfort will cripple you in obedience to Jesus. You know what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5? He, he encourages the church to pepper their speech, to speak in a way that reflects kingdom. And then he says to them, guard your hearts from greed and, and covetousness because that's idolatry. Greed and covetousness is idolatry. You know what's interesting is that when, you, when you're spending time with people, if you're pastoring or if you're a leader or if you're a brother that's involved or a sister that's involved, with people, you know, sometimes when we, when we get together, we pray for one another, we, consist, we confess our sins to one another. It's, it's healthy, it's biblical. Amen. And often, well, you know, I'm struggling with anger, I'm struggling with lust, I'm struggling with, you know, uh, confusion about what I should do. I don't think I've ever heard anybody tell me, at least in the last five to seven years, I'm struggling with idolatry. <laughs> You know, I have a, I'm really going through something, I need you to pray with me, I'm struggling with idolatry. What do you mean, I love money too much? It's, I don't know, maybe, 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 in, maybe you hear it more. I, I don't run into that kind of stuff too often. But, but Jesus says in Matthew 13 and Mark 4, when he's talking about the seed of the gospel that's planted in nations of the world and our own human hearts as it grows and as, as it develops, the love of money and the desire for other things choke out the seed. Do you know how often in our own hearts we, we take a step back from going all the way with God because they might not have air conditioning there? The, 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 the bed might not be whatever of whatever quality of comfort. Maybe they got mosquitoes. Maybe the people speak a different language. Maybe I don't like spicy food. Do you know one time a pastor told me, God would never call me to Iraq because I sweat a lot. He literally told me, he was dead serious. He says, well, praise God, brother. I'm going to pray for you. He says, for me, I know God would never call me to the Middle East. I sweat a lot. And I get really sticky and really uncomfortable. But, but praise God that he called you. You must not have like your, your <laughs> you must not have sweat glands, you know. 
like a dog, you sweat through your tongue or something. We can only hear the call to go to the measure of revelation, repentance, and faith in our hearts. Jesus says, I have so much to say to you that you're not able to hear. But when we can behold his face in that place of worship, and when he reveals himself in that place of burning bush, it says that Moses turned to behold the voice that came out of the bush. He didn't just walk by the bush and write it down in his journal as part of a testimony of an experience he had with God. He stopped everything in that moment and gave all of his attention to that living voice that was coming out of that bush. And what's so significant about a bush anyways? There's nothing so significant about a bush. It's not about the bush. It's about what's possessing the bush. Just like your own life, don't disqualify yourself because of your past or what you think you can or can't do. Well, I'm not good at learning languages. Well, I'm not good at doing at preaching. I'm not good at this or the other. I can't do this or the other. It's not about the bush. It's about the fire that possesses it. It's not about how difficult the land is. It's about the flame that will possess it. And they will become a sacrifice unto God. And another major reason that often I believe that our hearts shrink back from going all the way with God, understanding our identity as priests before him, called to go. I'm not implying that all of you are called to sell all and move. I am implying that many of you are. In Jesus' name. Go to your neighborhoods. Go to your cities. Be faithful there. The Lord will speak to some of you about nations. May the Lord raise up another volunteer movement amongst universities like he did years ago where Ivy League students, Ivy League students, the kind of people that put up all their certificates on a wall, who make more than six-figure a year jobs and have dignity and respect in their communities, they sold all and went. John G. Lake over a hundred years ago, Today, modern day, he'd be a multi-millionaire called to go to South Africa, gave all his money away and went. C.T. Studd was a modern day athlete in England, gave all his money away to George Mueller and others serving orphans and he went to the very core of Central Africa, gave his life for the Africans. You can't do that and live in joy unless you've seen his face. But if you've seen his face, don't just keep walking and write it in your journal as an experience. Stop and continue to behold until the voice comes out and you become a burning bush to your own generation. And you no longer fear death. What's the worst that they could do to you? What's the worst that they could do to you? Kill you and promote you to glory? The Lord is raising up a generation in these last days that do not fear death. You know what the devil fears? The people that do not fear death. Do you know why? You know what it says in the book of Hebrews? It says that Jesus came and he crushed the power of death. From the one who controlled through the fear of death. And he kept people in slavery to the fear of death. Where they would not move because the potential of loss. We make decisions and don't make decisions based upon what we think we will lose that's valuable to us. But when we recognize that what has supreme value cannot be stolen, cannot be taken away, there's no fear. You're a free man. You're a free woman to live in the earth. As a worshiper, as a priest, when you understand they can take nothing from you. Who cares what they say about you on Facebook? In a, in, a, in a hypersensitive generation where all that matters is what people say about me. Who cares what they say? Who cares what they say? It doesn't matter what they say. It doesn't matter what they take away from you. We have the kind of wealth that we can't be robbed of. The worst thing they could do is promote you to glory. 
And may we remember afresh this morning that the Lord is no man's debtor. He never asks anything from us that he will not repay and reward many, many times over. I tell my children all the time, when we have, you know, devotions, different times, when we have devotions, especially when we first moved to Iraq in the Middle East, we would sit together and we would say, if the day comes or when the day comes that they should require, our lives should be required of us by the Lord as worship. When Abraham went up the mountain with his son, he tells his son, let's go up to the top and worship. When Jesus is martyred in that, I'm sorry, when, when, when Stephen is martyred in that first century church, Jesus stands up and receives the worship. If that ever were to happen, know this, that the Lord will multiply grace beyond any grace you've ever experienced prior to. Both in this life and you can bet in the ages to come. We have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. We can no longer be a people controlled by fear. What's going to happen to us? What if we die of cancer? Put that thought underneath your feet and behold the blood of Jesus. What if we lose? We can't lose. If you came to give your life, how do you lose if they take it? Jesus' game plan was to come and to give his life a ransom for many. Do you think he ever felt nervous that he might lose when they took it? Game plan. Come, lay down your life, give it for the people. They're like, we're going to kill you. He's like, I, then, I, then I fulfill why I came. Those early, as, 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 as our brother shared last night, that, that word for witness, that word for witness is the same word that they used for martyr or one who gave their lives for their faith. You know why? Because so many of the witnesses became that. It became a synonymous term. There's places in the world today that as your ministry profile grows, the X on your back grows. We're going to sift, sift through the motives of why you really want to, you know, why you want to grow in ministry. There's nothing to fear. I want you to stand. Please stand. And I don't know if we can get anybody in the keys or if there's a pad or anything. Just for the next couple of minutes. Brother Lou's going to come up here in a couple of minutes. But I want to invite you. I want to invite you to respond however you would respond. If you want to come up, I want you to come up and get before the Lord and respond. If you want to stay there in your seat, feel free to stay in your seat and respond. But in essence, this is our heart cry. We're, we're, we're continuing on. We believe that what the Lord started last night is continuing into this morning. And the Lord is asking us in a fresh way, will you love me? Remember what he asked Peter three times? Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Give yourself for my sheep. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed the people. Give yourself for a people. May the Lord renew our minds. By the power of his voice and the power of his word. Some of you have been terrorized by fear your whole lives. The Lord's going to break that this morning. Some of you have had idols in your heart, the idols of comfort. Listen, there's nothing wrong with comfort as long as you can walk away with it when Christ calls. There's not a thing wrong with money. Money's a, an amazing tool in advancing the gospel and the great commission. As long as you don't think about it more than you think about Jesus and serving others. More than you think about your family and things that have eternal significance. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you can part with it.
Thank you, Jesus. You make us a sacrifice. Lord, break off the stronghold of fear from hearts and minds in Jesus' name this morning. Every lying devil of fear be gone from your heart in Jesus' name. Freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom in Jesus' name. Freedom from fear in Jesus' name. Freedom from tyranny to the love of money in Jesus' name. Freedom from idolatry in Jesus' name. Freedom to love you, Lord. Clear the threshing floor in our hearts, Lord. Release the call, Lord, in Jesus' name. Release the call to nations. Release the call to nations this morning. Deposit the call to nations, to neighborhoods and cities and the United States of America. Deposit the call, Lord. Raise up a priesthood that would lay down their lives in the ministry of the gospel. Brother Lou, if you, uh, you can come, please. can just stay where you're at and seek God. In the 90s, this was every day. People would be crying out to God and weeping. And the preacher just had to go ahead and preach. So. I believe we're entering into the great, greatest sending era of evangelists and missionaries. In fact, maybe if America will send her youth to the nations of the earth, God may save this nation. Our forefathers came here and said that America was to be a light to the nations. We've failed so much, but if we would throw our sons and daughters into the unreached people groups and into the inner cities, we may see a mercy kiss from heaven over this nation simply because we're fulfilling the divine calling on this nation. Father, we pray, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord would begin to stir thousands of young men and women, God, to go in to fulfill the scroll of Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. You may be seated. If you want to stand and just pray and forget about what I say, that's okay too. But if you do have your Bibles, I'd like to encourage you 
to turn with me to John chapter 12. David's message is so connected with what's on my heart today. If you would turn to chapter 12 of John and verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who's from Bethsaida in Galilee. And they asked him, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Come on. Uh, there's thousands and millions of young people in America who are beginning to say, we wish to see Jesus. See, all this turmoil that's going on, all the division, the opioid crisis and all, folks, brothers and sisters, the 60s were like this, and it prepared the way for the 70s where Jesus the evangelist exploded with the Jesus movement. I'm not too concerned about the turmoil in the nation because I know when things begin to shake, Jesus the evangelist is going to arise in America and give us another season of the 70s and way beyond. They're saying we wish to see Jesus. But I'm stunned by this passage. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, well, let's get our website together. Jesus answered and said, let's start a Twitter campaign, an Instagram something blast, whatever that is. Jesus doesn't even answer the request. For those who want to see him, because there is no scene of Jesus unless there has first been an offering at the cross. We are looking for better methods. We're looking for better implementation of technology, which thank God we have. But brothers and sisters, Jesus was not looking to set up an appointment with the Greek. Here's how Jesus answered. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it. He must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor me. Oh, what a mighty thing. He said, there's not going to be a scene of Jesus unless there's a willingness to go to the cross. People want stages. They want thousands on their Twitter accounts. As if you even have anything to say. You haven't gone through the sufferings and the difficulties and the challenges. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. I feel a lot of times our American Christian enterprise is filled with doing stuff rather than with moving heaven with the sacrifice of our lives. I want you to notice in this passage, I'm stunned by it. He says, the hour has come. He didn't say the year has come. He didn't say the month has come. The hour has come. Brothers and sisters, there are moments called an hour where you have to seize your calling for that very moment or you miss everything. You can be faithful your whole life. But if you miss the divine moment where God says, it's time for an offer. You'll never step into your divine fulfillment or your convergence. 
want you to get this. He said, and shall I ask the Lord to save me from this hour? Isn't it interesting that the hour of glory is actually an hour that you would really like to cry out to be saved from? Maybe this doesn't make sense, but I feel, he says this, and shall I say, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I've come into the world. Oh my God, to know that you're in the hour of the fulfillment of your purpose. Jesus knew his hour. He knew his purpose. And his purpose was to go to the cross. And before there will ever be massive fruit and a great and a great coming to the Lord in America, there is going to be an hour when someone enters into the passions of Jesus and lays their life out to break principalities and powers. Principalities and powers are broken at the altar of intercession. I love this sin video, Michael. What you say in that sin video, is there anyone willing just to sacrifice, to maybe turn a whole nation? This passage just stuns me. The key for the Greeks to see Jesus is to be, is to be willing to go to the cross. I feel like I'm in that moment the purpose of God for my own life. And I'd like to share a few mo moments. Most of you've heard my story. You must get bored. I don't have any other message. I just, I just want to just do my story. How many want to do the story that God wrote about your life? And in that story, there are moments that you must seize and risk everything. Psalms 40, I love it. He said, burn offerings and sacrifices you have not desired. God is not into religion. He said, burning offerings and sacrifices you have not desired. Listen, if you're fasting to somehow do a duty before God, forget it. Have a burger. <laughs> burn offerings and sacrifices you have not desired, but my ears you have opened. What a statement, he says this. Then I said, here I come. It's written to me in the scroll of the book to do your will, to be able to say in your life, here I come. I found what's in my scroll written by God. I've come into my moment for such a time as this. And to step into that moment, not with religious sacrifice, but delight. Because it started with the hearing of the ears. He says, when it, you get your ears opened, then your sacrifice is actually delight because it's filled with faith. Because on the other side of the sacrifice is divine fruit like you have never seen. I remember flying home from Canada in 2003. I was reading a book on William Wilberforce. And I'm reading it, there's a quote in that book that would be well worth his whole life to give himself for the ending of the slave trade in England. And when I read it, the Holy Spirit fell on me and God opened my ears as weeping in the plain. And I said, and the Lord said to me, you will raise up a prayer movement in America for the ending of abortion. <laughs> Little did I know that the opening of that year brought such delight that God gave us a series of dreams where I walked with my family and my children and 70 kids, slept in ghettos, slept in gym floors with my wife nursing her infant son. We walked across America praying for the native issues and the ending of abortion. Little did I realize that a worldwide movement would break out out of that obedience. My ears were open. He 
He says, burn off his sacrifice you have not desired, but my ears you have opened. Then I said, lo, it is written to me in the book. Here I come. God wants to baptize a generation of men and women into their scroll so they're not struggling what their job description is in life. They know for the reason for which they've come into the earth. I want you to lift your hands right now. I want to pray that God would invade this place with dreams so powerful. It would institute callings. Men and women are having callings to go to nations. They wouldn't even think about it. But suddenly one night their ears are open. Holy Spirit, come. Man, this is the largest crowd. I did just saw you all of a sudden. Lord, this, this crowd could turn America back to God. If they're obedient, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Holy Spirit, invade lives with a whirlwind of prophecy, prophetic revelation, and dreams that men and women will get caught up in the divine swirl of heaven's activity for their lives in Jesus' name. And if you're old dudes, the Bible says your old dudes will dream dreams. There's always another chapter until you're dead. Dreams are like scrolls or chapter titles to the next chapters of your lives. They tell you what could be if you're willing to risk everything and offer yourself on the altar. David said this. He said, my ears you've opened, but Jesus himself takes that scripture in Isaiah and Psalm 40. And in Hebrews 10, it takes it for himself. And Jesus says this. He says, burn offerings and sacrifices you have not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. He shifts it from my ears you have opened to a body you have prepared for me. In other words, you have never fully heard the voice of God unless you've laid down your body to fulfill that. You have never listened to the voice. You can have a prophecy and it will tickle your little spirit, but unless there is a body prepared to lay down, it, you haven't even heard God yet. An offering of life. And Jesus said, a body you've prepared for me. I feel like the scroll of my life is coming at least to some kind of convergence right now in Orlando. You get old, older like me, you know, Randy, us older guys, we look through the rear view mirror of our lives and we realize none of it was an accident. There was a divine tapestry of heaven. Your prophetic activity 20 years ago wasn't an isolated encounter. It was actually God laying DNA. That those dreams and visions were not to be like shooting stars in the night and you forget them. They were to be beacons when you cannot find your way to go back and revisit your prophetic journal over and over and over again. And God, if you're willing to keep going on the storyline and take the risks and the sacrifices to offer up your body, at the end of it, you are a divine novel from heaven. An epistle, a living epistle read by all men. God had a dream about your life before you were born and wrapped a body around it to fulfill it. You probably heard that. I, I can't get I am a walking dream of heaven. I am a walking dream of heaven. I'll go back to my scroll because I'm headed for something here today. Many of you have heard me already, but I want to hit it. I've been over the last six days in Miami. I've been in Fort Lauderdale. I've been in Sarasota. I've been in Gainesville, preaching up and down the state because I believe Florida is becoming a swing state for a great awakening. I'm not saying hype. 
I'm trying to follow my story. 1999, many of you hear it. But you know, I don't get tired of telling my story because it's a good one. And so is yours. And in 1999, I prayed a prayer. How can I turn America back to God? How many have heard that story? Oh, not that many. I'm going to just spit on these folks right here. In one moment, I reached up into heaven and got a hold of God. There are, there are maybe one or two prayers in your life that you feel at one moment you reached it into heaven and you got a hold of God. And you almost felt like everything was possible. Isn't that right? Of course, you wake up the next day as a mere mortal, bad breath and everything else, thinking, yeah, who's going to pay for it? But for that moment, faith laid hold of you. And I laid hold of God in 1999, praying for the end, uh, praying that America could turn back to God. It seemed like an outrageous prayer. The Lord wants to give us permission to pray outrageous prayers. I don't want a skinny story. I want the thick novel of heaven that he dreamed about me before I was ever born. And that will actually separate you from a lot of other side novels. Write your own. No, don't write your own. Get a ghost writer. Holy Ghost. Really? And a woman came to me soon after this. I'd been preaching that the John the Baptist Nazarites are coming to Washington, D.C. and put a million on the mall in D.C. And it will be a sign that there's coming a shift and a turning of America back to God. Come on, I, I, I gathered 4,500 kids to fast and pray for five days that stadiums would be filled in America with a John the Baptist movement. Brothers and sisters, you get into the dream stream of heaven. You get carried along by more than your nice organizational abilities. You want the, the breath of heaven. I don't want just the media campaign. I want heaven to take my life as an offering. That men and women will move, not because of me, but because heaven. Because if you can move heaven, heaven can move men. <laughs> Pulling away from, from the need to be a poured out offering. A woman came to me. She said, you don't know who I am. The Lord told me to pay your salary this year because you're going to start something with the youth of America that will change the destiny of the nation. Many of you have heard this a million times. Every time I say it, it prophesies again that it's a real deal. Every time I go over my story, I'm getting more and more baptized. Like Abraham, he did not get weak in faith, but grew stronger in faith. I love that passage, that Abraham became stronger in faith, did not waver in unbelief. I'm thinking, what Bible did, was Jesus or God reading? This is Abraham. He didn't waver in unbelief, or really? This gives hope to every one of us. But a man said this, he wasn't looking at his ups and downs. He was looking at the lifetime of the trajectory of his faith was ever increasing, even in the midst of his failures. That trajectory was moving until he could get a young man and the young man would give him a nation. And then the nation would give him the nations of the earth. I have not seen nor ear heard all that God has prepared for those who love him. But these things are revealed to us in the spirit. For the spirit searches the deep things of God. There is a realm in heaven that has all of God's thoughts towards you. Hidden in Christ. But you have a search in you. To search out the dream of God, the fullness of his plan. Sometimes it's fasting that's the great search engine. 
You shut down everything. But God gives you bread from heaven because you want his story rather than following someone else's miserable Facebook line. I never did understand why they put food on those stupid Facebooks. What if they put some empty plates? Because you're fasting. <laughs> I, mean, I must have spit a, I might have spit on this guy or something. Let me get to this. A woman came to me, she said, I'll pay your salary this year. She paid my salary for 16 years. She's 95 years old, still alive. Can't pay my salary anymore. She came to me and she said, have you ever thought about putting kids on the mole like promise keepers? I said, ma'am, I prophesied it. Two years ago, she said, I'll give you $100,000 to start it. It started a supernatural movement that led to 400,000 young people. Pre-social media. Someone said that great leaders give articulation to that which is being groaned in the masses, thereby completing the circuit from the solo leader to the masses creating mass movements. We need men with voices that can prophesy that bones will rattle and stadiums will be filled in America with souls being saved. Come on. Four hundred thousand came, and it was a John the Baptist. I had a dream in 1999, in, in 2000, before that call. And in the dream, I was overwhelmed with the impossibility of seeing America turn back to God. Do you see how the dream was connected to the prayer? He's answering my prayer. He says it's impossible to see America turn back to God. But in the dream, Luke 1, 17, rolls in front of me like a scroll. He shall go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the rebellious to the wisdom of the righteous. I woke up and the Lord says, what I am pouring out in America is stronger than the rebellion. It did not say it would end the rebellion, but it is stronger. And I knew the Lord was showing me my scroll. I'm not John the Baptist, but I had somewhat of the DNA of fasting and prayer and Nazarite young people arising. And that sound, God says, this is your scroll. I know what the scroll of my life has been for the last 18 years. Some time ago, I was praying, God, has the call failed? Seems like it's failed because the rebellion surely hasn't been broken. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. He said, Lou, if it truly was a John the Baptist movement, you can bet there's a Jesus movement coming. Because the last word of John was not prepare the way of the Lord. It was behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the And he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Stand with me for a moment. I want you to pray. Let there come a mass beholding of the Lamb of God. God, give us a mighty baptism. I don't want to look back to the charismatic movement. I don't want to look back to Azusa Street. We have to have a generation baptized with fire. Lift your voices. Begin to cry to God. From Orlando, lose a mighty baptism of the Holy Spirit again. And Lord, bring forth a mass beholding. Lord, we pray that Jesus, the evangelist, would come forth in America. Lord, he's already been here. Men like Randy Clark and Daniel Glenn and Michael. Jesus, the evangelist, is, is here. But there are moments of time when it takes a prof a profound emphasis where Jesus the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher manifests himself in certain seasons of time as the apostle, as the prophet, as the evangelist, as the pastor, teacher. But there are times like in the 70s, Jesus the evangelist. 
There's evangelistic callings coming on people here today. We don't have to wait for the send to a stadium event here in the Citrus Bowl World Camping Stadium. It begins here. Say, so Lord, put upon me a spirit of evangelism. Let me speed dial this. All these years praying that John the Baptist scroll. And then these YWAM guys came into my living room. Andy Bird, Brian Brandt, the adrenaline gland of the body of Christ. You didn't get that. Thank you, Daniel. You got it. And they said there's coming a shift to the call. And it will not be just fasting prayer, but the proclamation of the gospel. Signs and wonders in stadiums we build it be filled. And Billy Graham's mantle. It's coming on a nation. Seven years ago, we prayed for two days. These guys walked in. We're in my living room, and a prophet called from Nashville to my friend and says, you know where Lou Engle is? Yeah, he's in this meeting. Tell him I had a visitation last night. Tell him that the Lord said there's coming a shift to the call, and it will not be just fasting and prayer, but the proclamation of the gospel. Signs and wonders and stadiums will be filled, and Billy Graham's mantle is coming on this nation. I know this is what you do with prophetic words like that. When Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and said, buy my field at Anathoth. And it says, and then my brother Hanamel came to me and said, buy my field at Anathoth. Then I knew it was the word of the Lord. When a confirmation so powerfully unites the prophetic word, you are to be baptized in confidence and not have a casual approach to the prophetic. The moment is now. It must be now. We can't wait for another four years for a great awakening. And there's a flashpoint moment. The hour has come. The body you have prepared for me. And then the following year, I was in Orlando. Orlando House of Prayer with YWAM. And there, these brothers said to me, going to hold pre-send rallies. And the word will be called, and they will be called Ekbalo. Maybe you've heard me preach this, but you haven't heard me until you've obeyed the word. The word Ekbalo is the word that Jesus uses when he comes out and he sees the harvest field. He's broken to pieces, shattered, and he comes out there harassed and helpless. I can't help but thinking as he's going to the lost sheep of Israel, suddenly he's caught up and he sees the billions of Buddhists yet to come to Christ, the billions of Muslims and Hindus. I wonder if he's overwhelmed, realizing the limitations of his own incarnation. He needs thousands like like himself and he comes out and he gathers his leaders his his his, his disciples and he doesn't say the harvest truly is plentiful but the laborers are few therefore pray once in a while like, that the Lord would send some laborers out there he doesn't say that the word didomai is the first word of that, of that prayer. It is the word not for pray. It is the word for beg. It's an imperative command. Jesus came out filled with pathos and passion. And he says, I command you to beg me. I command you to beg me. Oh, if the church worldwide would begin to beg God. If America would begin to beg God not to send laborers. I'm okay with the word, but that's not what it means. It's the word ekbalo. It's the word that Jesus uses when he says, if I by the finger of God ekbalo demons, it's drive out demons. Listen, when Jesus drives out demons, demons got to go. When Jesus drives out laborers, labor. I want to start a revolution here in Orlando for Jesus the evangelist to be multiplied in tens of thousands. I have a dream today that all over the world, in Argentina, Indonesia, in Russia, in Europe, the church worldwide would be praying, God, we beg you. Hurl for labors 
into the harvest. I begin to pray that prayer, and the Lord began to show me it works because it worked in my own family. My daughter, I was praying day and night, praying that prayer, and I'm trying to, I, I, I'm trying to be faithful to it and ignite it afresh. And my daughter, 17 year old, comes to me, she says, Dad, I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw Lauren Cunningham, the leader of YWAM, on a stage, and he was preaching on the mantle of Moses, coming to Joshua. And she said, I was in the front row, Dad, and he was preaching to me. She said in the dream, suddenly he fell to the stage, on the stage and died. She said, I leaped up on the stage and began to give him CPR, crying, you can't die yet. Your task isn't finished. You can't die yet. Your task isn't finished. She said, Dad, he raised from the dead, grabbed me from the shoulders and said, it's not my task to finish. It's yours. Billy Graham has passed. It's not his task to finish. It's your. It's the church of America. It's her task to fulfill this prayer. Because of that, she went into the Himalayas, learned the language, translated for YWAM teams. She preached at Azusa now, and people are all over in the nations because they heard my 18-year-old daughter preach and mobilize missions. Father Luce, mobilizers, mobilizers of missions, mobilizers of prayer, mobilizers of evangelism. Then my son came to me. He said, Dad, Lou, I, Lou yeah. he said, Dad, I had a dream. I was in this huge auditorium in the back row, and in the dream, Lord Cunningham was on stage preaching. And he was preaching, and he said, I ran from my seat out to my car, weeping under the passion of the Lord, crying, here am I, Lord, send me. Here am I, Lord, send me. He ended up in the Himalayas with the Jesus field, healing the sick, preaching the gospel. Why? Because God answered the prayer of a dad. Pearl for labors. What if all of us tonight begin to pray, Lord of the harvest, we beg you, loose signs and wonders in the streets. Hurl for labors. This day, this very moment, could shape the future of the world if the church gets their ears open, which you are, but has to put a body to it. You've got to act and obey. I don't want to preach this anymore. I don't want to touch any, tickle people's ears. Let's start tonight. And in two and a half months, we're going down to the Jordan River at Orlando. And I'll end with this. The beginning of this year, I was fasting in Assembly of God, little church in Naleho, Hawaii, fasting for two, two or three months. And I'm reading how the mantle of, of Elijah came on Elisha. And I wrote in my Bible, I got it right here, and I wrote, Billy Graham, I will not let you go until I get a double portion of your spirit on the next generation. I had no idea when I said 2, 12, 18, that within 10 days, Billy Graham would die. I felt I was with, like one of the sons of the prophets. Don't you know that your master is soon to be taken from you today? There is a today, and you can't miss that today. They went down to the Jordan, and in one day, Elisha gets the mantle of Elijah. I believe on February 23rd, if I'm trying to hear my story right, if I'm trying to hear the scroll, it was a John to Jesus movement on 216. As I'm flying home from Hawaii, I write down in my Bible where it says, and Elijah went down to the Jordan. And I wrote down in my Bible, I said, I'm flying home from Hawaii. Wow. I'm going to Orlando, to the Jordan. From the call to the send. For Billy Graham's mantle. Little did I know that in three days that he would actually die and that we had actually set up a meeting with evangelists Michael Kulianos, Daniel Kalenda, Todd White, uh, Andy. We had no idea, but we were gathering to talk about going to that stadium. It was three days after his death. His, de his death. I gotta believe 
that the prophetic moment is now. And someone has to say, shall you save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I've seen 18 years of stadiums, but I feel the Lord searching me out to test me. Do I want him more than that comfort? Do I want him more than having a nice little place in Colorado Springs with my eight grandchildren and seven children? I hear the Lord say, Lou, this is the moment for which you are born. I feel that calling to fast and say, God, now, there is no alternative but a revival in America. And maybe we've come here for the chapter to turn. Father, tonight, launch a vision. Stir all of America. Stir all of America. And go to the send and you can register. But I have a feeling some of you hear the voice tonight and say, I've been called to be an evangelist and I'm not gonna waltz into this gathering. I prophesied the John the Baptist movement in the most anointing I've ever known, 1997, and the people had fasted 30 days in preparation, and I stepped into a prophetic unction that caused for the last 18 years a movement. But I was saying, John, I've ended the call. I can't go into the old. I gotta move into the new. I've locked myself on to evangelists now. I'm an intercessor prophet kind of guy, nonprofit organization. But I, I, the Lord said, you've got to lock on to the evangelists right now. Paul Cain saw it. The stadiums of America would be filled. No bad news tonight, only good news. The media would cover it. Nameless, faceless people are in the stadiums. There's a healing there. There's a resurrection. He says, oh, there's coming a baptism we know nothing about today can you say I'm not going to live for comfort or the world anymore I've heard the voice of the Lord I offer myself on the altar of intercession I, all, I offer myself on the altar of going to the hardest darkest places I bless this company tonight fan the flames of revival out of this place. Let Jesus' image be manifested. I'm living for another scroll today. I'm not looking for Luke 117. I'm looking for Luke 418, where Jesus opened the scroll of Isaiah, and he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news. Come on, reach up. God, open that scroll over America. Open the scroll of Jesus. I end here, third time I've ended. Paul Kane's mom, he went through difficulties. Paul has gone through difficulties. But what a prophetic calling on his life. He said his mom was pregnant with him at age 44, ravaged by three diseases. Her breasts were completely eaten away. The doctor said, you'll never give birth to this child and you will not live. But the Lord came to her and said, you shall have a boy and you shall name him Paul for he will do the miracles of St. Paul. He was one of the early healing revivalists. 70 years, it's 70 years right now. Let Daniel, when he heard it was 70 years, he set his face to fasting. She gave birth to Paul and she nursed him on completely restored breasts. 70 years ago, 1949, Billy Graham's tent blew up in Los Angeles, and the rest is history. You may be one of those that no one knows, but God is preparing you to roar. To roar that. Anna Cain lived to 104 years old. She was dying, and she said to Paul, I've given you many words, but I'm going to give you the greatest word I've ever delivered. And he said, what is it? And she said, I don't know yet. <laughs> she went into a coma for two months. They prayed her out of that coma. And she said, the Lord gave me the word. The Lord has given you Paul and the whole world. Luke 418. And she died on 418 at 418. Mike Bickle was actually there. Come on, lift your hands. Oh, we, we have to live for Jesus. Jesus is coming. There is one coming, John said. 
There is one coming. Come on, brothers and sisters. Can we begin to live that Jesus the evangelist will arise in America? Give a shout to God. Just do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Holy Spirit, still every word that we heard today, still everything, every thought, every desire, every dream, seal it in Jesus' name. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We love you. Mm.